All right, hi everybody. My name is David Gully, and I'm at Bentley University, and this is a monetary policy update uh, effective January 2020. So we have three topics here today. Uh, first, we'll talk about the uh, moves that the Fed made in 2019 regarding the Fed funds rate. And please note, we have an entire uh, series of videos on the reserves market that help explain how exactly the, cha the Fed changes the Fed funds rate. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the balance sheet moves that the Fed made in 2019. Uh, we have here again a series of videos on the Fed's balance sheet that explains how the Fed changes its balance sheet and how that impacts the economy. And then finally, there were some really interesting things happen uh, in September 2019 in the repo market, and so we'll talk about some of those. Uh, please see our uh, YouTube channel, the Bentley University EC391, uh, for a whole series of uh, what we think are very informative and helpful videos on different aspects of monetary policy. So starting off here, uh, so in 2018, the Fed uh, raised the federal funds rate target for separate occasions, and it was doing so in the context of um, an expanding economy, one that they thought was approaching full employment, and they were concerned that there might be eventually upward pressure on inflation. However, in 2019, things changed pretty dramatically, thanks to uh, inflation being below the Fed's target of 2%, thanks to slowing global economic growth, and thanks to trade tensions, uh, the Fed decided it would be prudent to reduce the federal funds rate at three consecutive meetings in the July, the September, and the October 2019 meetings. Each time, they reduce it by 25 basis points or by uh, a quarter of a percentage point. Now, after the first cut in July, financial markets got pretty excited, and they were expecting a whole number of subsequent rate cuts in addition to the July cut. However, in his press conference right after the meeting, uh, Jerome Powell used two words that are now fairly famous, mid-cycle adjustment. And what he was trying to get across is that financial markets should not count on many, many rate cuts. The idea here is he specifically mentioned uh, episodes in 1995 and 1996, along in 1998, when the Fed made some what they referred to as insurance cuts to make sure that various risks that existed at the time didn't blow back and affect the U.S. economy. So the point here is that there were uh, the three rate cuts, and what was critical is that it's the expected path of policy that matters more than any particular individual policy move. Uh, in fact, we have a whole series of videos uh, on Fed uh, communication, and one specifically uh, that might be particularly helpful here is we have a whole video on the concept of forward guidance and how the Fed can use that uh, to conduct policy. And so here we have uh, the Fed funds rate behavior um, over about the last five years or so. And you can see that in 2018, uh, there were a whole uh, series of rate increases. Here's the first, second, third, and fourth in 2018. And then you can see here the first, second, and third rate cuts in 2019. And so what we can do is we can zoom in on those three rate cuts. And so again, here's the July, whoops, here's the July, here's the September, and there's the October. But what's most interesting, and we're going to return to this later, is that the Fed was having a little bit of trouble keeping the federal funds rate within its target. In fact, this one right here, that was the September, night, the September 2019 issue that we'll talk about. But as you can see here, effective roughly in January 2020, the Fed has now uh, attained again good control of the federal funds rate. So what we can do is we can visualize exactly how the Fed uh, impacts the federal funds rate by using the market for reserves. Again, as I noted earlier, we have a whole video series that explains this market. The idea is that the federal funds rate is set by supply and demand. And so what the Fed does, it affects uh, what it refers to as two administered rate. First, there's the interest on reserves rate. And then second, there's the interest on the ONRRP facility. That's Overnight Reverse Repurchase Facility. And these are what the Fed refers to as administered rates. So the Fed announces that these rates are rising, or in this case, falling. And so what happens is that the horizontal component of the demand curve shifts downward in parallel. And so by pushing these two administered rates down, the Fed puts downward pressure on not just the federal funds rate, but all short-term interest rates. And so again, they note, again, to, to note here, the Fed lowers these two administered rates. And when the Fed started using this system is that the uh, IOR rate and the ONRP rates were 
25 basis points, or in other words, a quarter of a percentage point different from each other. Now, that interest rate differential is only a tenth of a percentage point, or in other words, 10 basis points. And this is true even though the Fed still has a 25 basis point spread between the high and the low values of the federal funds rate that it wants to attain. And the general idea here is that thanks to a, a large increase in the number of new treasury bills uh, that the US Treasury is selling, that's been putting upward pressure, other things equal, on all short-term interest rates, including the federal funds rate. And so what the Fed has had to do is it had to push down the interest on reserves target relative to the top of the Fed funds rate range in order to try to keep the Fed funds rate within its objective target range. And as an interesting little aside here, the use of uh, or the take up of the ONRP facility has been very low. And what's going on here is that this facility is specifically directed at non-bank financial institutions. And these non-bank financial institutions have very attractive short-term interest rate alternatives compared to the ONRP facility. So not very many people, not very many institutions are using it right now. And so what's been happening is the Fed has had some trouble in terms of controlling uh, the federal funds rate. It's done a good job now, it's back on track, but there were some difficulties. Again, we'll look at this in more detail shortly. And so what we wanna to turn to now is look at the Fed's balance sheets actions. And we'll see that this is correlated or related to some of the difficulties the Fed had in controlling the federal funds rate. So in October of 2017, the Fed decided to reduce the size of its balance sheet. It had stopped increasing it at a rate of about $4.5 trillion in 2014. It kept that roughly constant through October 2017. And then what they tried to do is they said, okay, well, let's reduce the size of the balance sheet to get uh, the size of the balance sheet down to an efficient and effective size in order to conduct policy. So using the words of John Williams here from, he's the president of the New York Fed, what do we mean by efficient and effective? So again, this is John Williams here. So efficient means that the level of reserves is not excessive relative to what's needed to be effective. And effective means that typical temporary movements in the demand or supply of reserves don't cause large changes in the federal funds rate without active management of reserves. There goes my little motion detector light. I apologize for that little technical glitch there. And so what we can see then is what happens uh, visually in, in the reserves market. So we can go back to our reserves market here. So here's what, uh, here's what John Williams means. So the idea is that normal ordinary forces in the reserves market can shift the supply to the right or shift the supply to the left. Ordinary forces can increase or decrease the demand for reserves. And these increases or decreases in the demand for reserves have the potential to impact the federal funds rate. And so what the Fed tries to do is it tries to maintain operation on the horizontal component of the demand for reserves curve. And so what it's trying to do is it's trying to keep the supply intersected with the demand curve on the horizontal component and so that any temporary fluctuations in either demand or supply don't have an impact on the federal funds rate. And so the Fed is trying to achieve that objective without being very, very far to the right. So for example, what would be inefficient in John Williams' view of the world would be a supply curve that would be way out here to the right. So that would be inefficient in that there were too many reserves in order to meet the Fed's definition of efficient. So how does the Fed go about reducing the size of the balance sheet? Well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. The Fed's balance sheet, and we'll have a visual of this in just a couple of minutes, has various types of assets on it, specifically in this case, mortgage-backed securities and treasury securities. And what they do is they let those maturity, those securities mature, and they don't replace them with new ones. And as they mature and are not replaced with new ones, the Fed's balance sheet will naturally decline. And at its maximum point, when the Fed was letting the balance sheet decline, it was declining up to a rate of $50 billion per month. But what they did in July 2019, along with their first uh, rate cut of the federal funds, they decided to end the drawdown of the balance sheet. They originally had planned to end it in October 2019. They instead decided to end it in August 2019. 
Now, the idea is it turns out this is going to have a fairly modest practical impact, but helpfully it might serve, serve as a signal that the Fed will act as needed to maintain a healthy economic recovery. So in terms of the, the size of the balance sheet, a whole number of economists, including uh, former Chair Ben Bernanke, they think that the balance sheet should remain relatively large. In fact, specifically in 2019, the Fed decided that they are going to use what they refer to as an ample reserves framework, such as the IOR and ONRP rates will continue uh, in the foreseeable future. And specifically, if you think back to the reserves curve we just drew a few minutes ago, that means the reserves market is functioning on the horizontal portion of the demand curve. So that's what they mean by ample reserves. And so at the moment, the Fed is letting mortgage-backed securities, so that's what MBS stands for, mortgage-backed securities, they're letting those mature and they're replacing them with treasury securities so that the balance sheet is moving more toward treasuries and away from mortgage-backed securities. So now we have a visual of the Fed's um, composition of the balance of the assets on the balance sheet. And so this is from the Cleveland Fed. This is a very helpful visual. And so you can see here over on the left is that prior to the financial crisis, the Fed's balance sheet was about $800 billion, give or take. And most of the Fed's balance sheet was comprised of treasury bills. But then over time, that size and that composition has changed very dramatically. So here you can see, this is QE1 and the expansion of the balance sheet based on mortgage-backed securities and also longer-term treasury securities. Here you can see QE2. This was, this was exclusively an increase in treasury securities. And then here you can see QE3. That's an increase of both mortgage-backed securities and treasury securities. Then you can see from 2014 through October 2017, the Fed maintained the size of its balance sheet. Then in October 2017 to August 2019, the Fed reduced the size of the balance sheet. And so what they were doing is they were letting mortgage-backed securities decline, and they were increasing the relative uh, amounts of uh, treasury bills and treasury securities in general. So now let's turn to September 2019. So what happened there? So we saw, and I noted specifically, that there was a spike in the federal funds rate in September. And so what happened is there was a lot of volatility in short-term interest rates in the what we call the repo market. I'll explain this in a second. And even the federal funds rate increased dramatically. Now, what caused this? Well, initially the cause was thought to be two things. First, the settlement of a treasury bill auction and quarterly corporate tax payments. What happens is that when people buy treasuries or financial institutions buy treasuries, these have to be paid for. When companies pay corporate profit tax payments quarterly, those will come out of checking account balances. So in effect, by paying for the treasury bills and making corporate tax payments, aggregate reserves in the banking system, or in other words, the supply of reserves in the banking system fell dramatically. And this reduced the availability of funds for financial institutions to borrow. So we need to talk first about what is the repo market. So repo is short for repurchase agreement. And so in this particular transaction, Fed, the Fed and financial institutions, they swap or they trade uh, cash, not, exact, not little cash, for treasuries. So in effect, the key thing to think about in a repo loan is that it is nothing more than a collateralized loan. So in this transaction, the Fed loans money to a financial institution, and in turn, the financial institution puts up treasuries as collateral. And I should also note that uh, repo agreements can also be conducted between two financial institutions. It doesn't need to be between the Fed and a financial institution. So this particular market is extremely important in the functioning of the short-term lending market. It's, it's billions and billions and billions of dollars per day. Now, under normal circumstances, the repo rate and the Fed funds rate are extremely close to each other. However, in September 2019, the repo rate spiked up, and this even spilled over into the federal funds market. And so here we have a, a visual of this. And so you can see, whoops, let me do this here. Let me change this for a second. There we go. So you can see that the, the repo rate is in blue, and the federal funds rate is in orange. 
So you can see the large spike in the repo rate, and it had a smaller spike in the federal funds rate. But you can see that after that, there were still some smaller spikes in the repo rate, but that over time, that the two rates converged closely together. So this graph goes from, from August through the end of 2019. So moving on here. So what's interesting is that in the uh, banking system, excess reserves, in other words, reserves not required uh, to be held by banks were over a trillion dollars. So here's the question, why didn't banks lend out some of those excess reserves into the repo market and turn a profit at the relatively high interest rate? Well, there's some interesting stuff going on here. So as we noted, in 2014, the Fed froze the balance sheet. They also began reducing it in 2017. And then what are called non-reserves, non-reserve liabilities on the Fed's balance sheet are increasing. And so what was going on, and we'll show the visual here in a second, is that excess reserves in the banking system were falling much faster than the overall size of the balance sheet. Now, combined with some more strict capital requirements, and what this happens to do is make banks uh, hold more capital that's safe and liquid, and reserves count as part of that. And also, interestingly, a concentration of banks that hold excess reserves. Excess reserves in the banking system might not really be so excess. So here's a, a, a quick visual of the Fed's balance sheet. Now, what I've got here is only some of the assets and some of the liabilities. These are going to be the most crucial ones here. So what's happening is that as the Fed reduces the size of its total balance sheet, treasuries are falling and mortgage-backed securities are falling. So in effect, the left side of the balance sheet is declining in value. So basic accounting requires the right side, the liability side, to fall as well. Well, what's happening over here, though, is that especially currency and circulation has been rising. And so if currency and circulation has been rising and the total balance sheet is falling, that's putting additional downward pressure on other components of liabilities. And specifically, reserves have been falling very dramatically, even more so relative to the size of the overall balance sheet. So here's a visual here. This is the aggregate size of excess reserves in the banking system. There's my motion detector again. And so you can see here, you can see the dramatic increase in the Fed's balance sheet. This is QE1, there's QE2, there's QE3. And as the, even the Fed held the size of the balance sheet constant, with currency in circulation rising, reserves fell. Once the Fed started decreasing the size of the balance sheet in 2017, reserves fell even more dramatically. So note, in just a few short years, excess reserves in the banking system have fallen by more than half, much more dramatically than the overall size of the Fed's balance sheet. So in effect, the Fed recognized they'd underestimated the actual scarcity of reserves. So they made two responses. So the first thing they did is they acted in a way to temporarily increase the supply of reserves in the banking system. And so they used what are referred to as overnight and term repo agreements to temporarily increase the supply of reserves. In other words, shift that horizontal supply curve to the right. And right now, again, this is January 2020, I'm recording this, they've agreed or, or are doing this through at least mid-February, and there's a chance that might be extended. And then they're also doing something a little bit more permanent. They're increasing their purchases of treasury bills by up to $60 billion per month through the second quarter of 2020. So this is a more permanent shift to the right to the supply of reserves curve. And so here we have a couple of visuals. We have the volume of overnight repos, and these are overnight. So these are one day repurchase agreements. And so you can see that beginning in September and through October, the Fed was using a pretty hefty volume of these types of repo agreements to add reserves to the banking system. But then toward the end of the year, demand for reserves fell somewhat. And so the Fed reduced its repo volume. But here you can see in, in early 2020, it's increased a little bit. They're also using what are called term repos. These agreements last more than overnight. And even though they vary, majority of them are two weeks, they're 14 days. And you can see here at the end of 2019, whoops, the end of 2019, they were falling. But here now they've increased a little bit at the very beginning of 2020. 
And so what the Fed has been doing here, again, let's go back to the Fed's balance sheet, is over on the left side, they have been increasing the volume of these overnight and these term repo loans. And they've been increasing the volume of treasury bills by up to 60 billion a month. And what these two have been doing is they have been increasing the aggregate size of reserves in the system. In other words, visually, it's shifting the supply reserves curve to the right. And so by observation, there seems to be a good effect here because at the end of 2019, the federal funds rate did not spike up again in response to any excessive increase in demand for, uh, for short-term borrowing. And so at least on that metric, without any volatility, the Fed's actions seem to have worked. And so finally here, you can see a visual over on the right side here. We can see that, again, this is the, oops, let me go back to the display here. There we go. Over on the far right, you can see that the size of the uh, Fed's balance sheet has started to increase again. Whoops. You can see that the Fed size of the balance sheet has started to increase again. A few minor technical difficulties. And so you can see that's the result of the repurchase agreements and the treasury bills. And so you can see that the treasury bills have started to rise. And the orange uh, uh, area here, this is short-term loans. And so that represents or is represented by uh, the, the Fed's increase in the use of repo loans. So thank you all very much. And I apologize for the minor technical difficulties.